the story of the uh, transfiguration, the account, is really an awesome and moving and glorious and mysterious and powerful. Once again, Jesus is transfigured before three of his disciples. His face is as bright as the sun and clothes are white as light. And then Moses and Elijah appear and they speak to Jesus. And a bright cloud overshadows them. And God himself then speaks. It's so awesome that the three disciples hit the ground and they bury their faces in the dirt. And then Jesus touches them and they open their eyes and, quote, they saw no one but Jesus only. Plain old Jesus, not the transfigured one. And that's it. That's it? Short little paragraph to describe something this awesome? Can you imagine an event of this magnitude happening in today's world? There's enough stuff here to write a book. Painstakingly describing all that happened and all that involved talking about the feelings and the experience of the disciples. You can make a full featured motion picture about the events of all the things happened before leading to this and after something like that. And then you can create a multi-session DVD based Bible study and uh, sell it in all the Christian stores together with an accompanying printed material on how to apply this event to marriages and raising children. So why does Matthew and other gospel writers as well, why do they say, why don't they use more, give us more? Why do they use such a, only a few words to describe something so glorious? Just can you imagine the mileage they could have made out of this account? Well, related to that question, but perhaps more importantly, is another question. Why does Jesus appear this glorious only for a short period of time? What if Jesus had transfigured himself, showing himself as an awesome God with a face bright as the sun and the clothes as white as light? What if he did, did just not to just for the three disciples, but what about the rest of the disciples? What if he showed himself like that to all of his followers? Not only his followers, but also his enemies. To the whole world. And they could all sing, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. What if Jesus did that? And spent all his life shining and glorious. Imagine that. Everywhere he'd go, he'd go a, a cloud would also follow him. And a loud voice proclaimed him. And bright and dazzling light would accompany him. So that no one would miss the significance of his presence. Imagine the impact of that. Not just a handful of disciples. But huge crowds would follow Jesus all the time. And what if he did something glorious all the time? Instead of healing a leper here and a blind man there, he'd get together a bunch of people and have them sit on the mountainside or stand on the seashore and, and wave his arms and move his garments and people would be healed. Hundreds of people and thousands of people at the same time. What if Jesus feed a bunch of people. Yeah, he fed a 5,000 people crowd one time. 
I remember people were so impressed. St. John writes, they, they, they wanted him to become a king. They followed him and they wanted him to become their bread king. Somebody who would feed them again and again. Just think about if he would agree. He would gain all kinds of followers because people would like to do that. They would like to get free stuff. He would feed them and down the road he probably could clothe them. Maybe would provide their financial needs as well. Pretty soon he'd be packing not just a side of, a, a side of the mountain or a seashore of his homeland. He'd move on. He'd start touring the amphitheaters, Roman amphitheaters, and the, then they had Greek stadiums by that time. He could speak his message of power and glory to a sold-out crowd every time he'd go someplace. But Jesus chose a different kind of glory. Not the kind of glory that people seek. Because yes, people, we seek glory. We're attracted to glory. However, the glory that we have in mind is not the glory of God. Not the one that Jesus chose. Our human understanding of glory is synonymous to things like prosperity and success, fame, power, honor, wealth, health. And so we take this human understanding of glory that is so appealing to us. Wouldn't you want to be wealthy and healthy and popular? And we think, well, that's what God wants to be. So we apply it to God, or rather to our interpretation of Him. What we the people want God to be like. Just look at the famous preachers of our modern times. The ones that pack stadiums and theaters with eager crowds, hungry for every word they speak, who write the best-selling books and have those bright, dazzling smiles and wear designer suits or very tight jeans. Some preach a prosperity gospel, saying that if you only believe hard enough, then God will grant you all kinds of favors. And He will give you wealth and success in your endeavors. And then they use themselves as prime examples, showcasing their estates and mansions and cars. And people in their crowds eat, them, eat it up and say, yeah, that could be me. God could bless me with all that stuff. Some preach the gospel of immediate healing, saying that if you believe hard enough, then God will heal you of whatever disease that you might have. Some actually do more. I mean, they move their arms around and... and uh, kind of twirl and run around on the stage in their designer suits in front of packed audiences and the people just get healed and they hit the floor overcome by just how awesome those preachers are. Now well, theirs is the Jesus of a fog machine cloud revealed to the emotionally elevated crowds in the bright lights of a laser show accompanied by, with rock drum fills and bass guitar riffs, preached with a loud, confident voice coming out of a dazzling white, capped teeth mouths. I'm guessing that you are not fixated on such preaching and such preachers. That's why you're here at St. John's. We're kind of the polar opposite of all the above. But let's be honest with ourselves. You and I still want similar glory. Think about it. You and I would rather have God work some miracle in our lives when we're suffering the disease than provide us with an enduring faith through a chronic illness. You and I would rather have God reward us Reward our faith with security and prosperity, then have him 
instead strengthen it by teaching us contentment when you and I have very little. You and I would rather have him use us as an example of success in your vocation than as an example of one who humbly endures setback after setback and trusts anyway. It's not that Jesus is incapable of healing or feeding or clothing or protecting or even making you rich. In fact, you will get all the above. One day, one day, you'll be healed. You will have great body. How about that? You will have safety and security. You will enjoy all kinds of treasures. I can guarantee you that. More than that, God guarantees you it will happen for sure in heaven. Now, in this life, he might give you some of this, a little bit, maybe much. But even those things, if he gives you all those things, they will only be temporal, earthly. By definition, temporary. Because we live in a sinful world. And when we are experiencing such blessings, they're only a preview, a foretaste of heaven. Because only in heaven you will have the true healing and the true wealth that nobody can take away from you. And think about, look at the resurrection, I mean, look at the transfiguration versus the rest of Jesus' ministry. For a fleeting moment, very short period of time, Jesus appears glorious. A hint of how he looks enthroned in heaven. But for the rest of the time, there's nothing in his appearance and his actions that make him glorious in the eyes of the world. That's because instead of human glory, Christ chose a different kind of glory. The glory of the cross. As Jesus foresees the cross, he proclaims in John 12, 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. When is the Son of God glorified? When he is crucified. Even though he doesn't look it, he is just as glorious when he is bloodied and dying on a cross as when he is enthroned in heaven. Why? Because God is by nature a servant. Therefore, there is nothing more glorious for him than to serve. And there's no greater service he can render than to die for the sins of the world, for your sins, my sins. That glory, the glory of the cross, is what Jesus chooses instead of the human glory. The glory of power and fame, success and popularity, acceptance and praise, celebrity and a life of luxury. So keep that in mind when you look at your daily life and complain. Same old, same old, plain old stuff. Why doesn't God do something glorious for me? See if you're convinced that the glory of God in this world is always something extraordinary, something always awesome, something that's bright and loud, something that either knocks you off your feet or elevates you ever so high, then you will spend your days waiting for God to do something glorious. And in doing so, you will miss the forest for the trees. You will miss the glorious service that the Lord provides you every day with your daily bread, with your daily breath, and with every grace and mercy he pours upon you because of his glorious death on the cross. Jesus is fully God and he possesses God's glory. But he doesn't display his glory 
in this fallen world. That's one of the teachings of this transfiguration. Not yet, anyway. That's why he instructs the disciples to be quiet about it. Instead, the focus on, is on something else. The Father declares, listen to him. Faith comes by hearing. It's given to you by the life-giving, powerful Word of God. But when Jesus comes back, on the last day, he will return in his glory. In heaven, you will get to see his glory. In the meantime, don't look for glory. Listen to him. And he declares to you as you listen to him, his glorious forgiveness. The Lord gave it to you in your baptism and he continues to give it to you in his absolution and in his, in his supper. They, those things, don't look glorious. Not according to the worldly standards, but they give you forgiveness, life, and salvation. For this is where the Lord is at work to save if you're looking for God to deliver you in some glorious ways that are spectacular to the eye, with a bright laser show or fog machine cloud or loud music or a dazzling white teeth smiling from your preacher who will promise you the world, then you will hold those humble things, the word and the sacraments in contempt. And then you'll completely miss the day of his visitation. But that is not for you. You rejoice in the transfiguration. Where you get to catch a glimpse of Jesus' heavenly glory. But until you and I are in heaven, you know that he shows his glory to you chiefly in his work of love and mercy. That grace he gives appears so lowly, but it is the glory that Christ has won by his cross, his cross for you. And so he declares you his glorious child because you are forgiven of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.